This lecture will discuss the development of the limbs. What we want to consider during this lecture is where the different structures that are found in the upper and lower limb come from and begin to talk about the factors involved in limb development. The limb is a classical sim, uh, system that's been used to really define a lot of the developmental paradigms involved in embryology. As we go through, we'll also remember where the skeletal muscle and the nerves develop from and how they get to the limbs. When we look at the development of the limbs, we can consider that during the fourth week, around day 31, a limb bud appears. A couple days later, uh, the hand actually appears. It appears like a paddle. And by day 36 of gestation, chondrification begins. Uh, at day 54, fingers are separated the limb is present and ossification begins. So at that point we need to consider bone formation and growth of the long bones. When we talk about the development of the limbs we're looking at contributions from the paraaxial mesoderm which will give rise to the skeletal muscle and lateral plate mesoderm, which will give rise to the connective tissue, bones, and cartilage in the upper limb. Again, you remember the paraaxial mesoderm gives rise to the somites. There are 42 to 44 somites, and the somites give rise to myotomes, which develop into muscles for the limbs. The C5 through T1 myotomes will contribute to the muscles of the upper limb. The L2 to S3 myotomes will contribute to the muscles of the lower limb. So to begin, at four weeks the limb buds appear. And their appearance is signaled by a thickening of the ectoderm, which covers a core of mesoderm where the cells have begun to proliferate. The ectoderm becomes pseudostratified in appearance and is called the apical ectodermal ridge. This is a picture from Dr. Kathy Sulik's website and in it it shows the beginning of limb development where a bud just is appearing and in it we can identify several of the axes that we need to talk about when we talk about limb development. We can talk about proximal versus distal. So there's a proximal distal axis in the limb. There is also anterior and posterior axes. Anterior being on the radial side or the thumb side, posterior being on the ulnar side, or the little finger. And then there is ventral and dorsal. Ventral being the flexors, dorsal being the extensors. One of the signals that people are looking for is what actually triggers this ectoderm and underlying mesoderm to be involved in limb development, both for the upper limb and for the lower limb. And while the signals are not clear yet, it seems that TBX5 and TBX4 for the upper and lower limbs respectively do play a role in at least identifying the ectoderm and mesoderm of the regions of the limb buds. In addition, we can identify by some of the Hox genes 
another relationship where the upper limb starts with a particular constellation of Hox genes while TBX and the Hox genes do not cause limb development they signal a region where that development is proceeding so we can talk about the development of the limb bud and refer to the development of the different axes when we talk about the proximal to distal axes we have to talk about the apical ectodermal ridge because that is going to initially influence the underlying mesoderm. One of the ways it influences that mesoderm is that it takes the mesodermal cells beneath the apical ectodermal ridge and those cells begin to proliferate. So there's a progress zone that develops. And in that progress zone, there are proliferating and undifferentiated cells. And that's a necessary zone for limb development. As the cells leave that progress zone, they will then begin to differentiate. The influence of the apical ectodermal ridge has been known for some time. Classic studies have shown us that if that apical ectodermal ridge is removed, the limb bud will stop developing. So if it's removed early, the limb won't develop at all. If the apical ectodermal ridge is removed later, some of the more proximal structures will develop, but the more distal structures will not. So that it is a time-dependent organization from proximal to distal as to the origin of the different structures in the limb. Now people have been searching for what the apical ectodermal ridge contributes that allows for this proximal distal development and it has been shown that fibroblast growth factor is important in limb development in that if one removes the apical ectodermal ridge and now replaces that with a bead soaked in fibroblast growth factor then limb development will proceed normally so the apical ectodermal ridge is producing fibroblast growth factor which is influencing the underlying mesoderm now that's not to say that the mesoderm isn't important because initially the mesoderm is what's going to influence the overlying ectoderm. And so this is a class classical uh, situation where mesoderm and ectoderm are going to reciprocally induce each other. So the mesoderm first secretes fibroblast growth factor 10 and that contributes to the apical ectodermal ridge formation. As we said, without the apical ectodermal ridge, limb buds will not develop. After the apical ectodermal ridge develops, then fibroblast growth factor 4 and 8 are going to, from the apical ectodermal ridge are going to maintain that progress zone of the mesoderm. Without FGF 4 and 8, cell death occurs and the distal structures will not develop so the apical ectodermal ridge is producing fibroblast growth factor 4 and 8 that allow for the progress zone to continue to develop now in terms of dorsal and ventral polarity what we know is that there are again differential expression of genes that allow for this polarity to develop. Radical fringe is expressed in the dorsal ectoderm and engrailed is expressed in the ventral ectoderm and these help to, contri to uh, determine the polarity in the dorsal ventral axis of the limb bud. And so engrailed 
uh, is important in the flexor or ventral compartment formation and engrailed represses the WNT7A. WNT7A is important in the development of the dorsal compartments of the limb bud and one of the ways that happens is that WNT7A induces LMX1 in the underlying mesoderm. So you can see the complexity that's developing in terms of developing this limb. Finally, we can talk about the anteroposterior axis in terms of digit formation and radius and ulnar formation. Important in the anterior posterior patterning that occurs is the zone of polarizing activity. The zone of polarizing activity is going to influence the overlying apical ectodermal ridge. The zone of polarizing activity is located in the posterior part of the limb bud. Again, if we go back to some of the classic experiments that were done on limb, what was found was there was this area of called the ZPA, zone of polarizing activity. If it was present, normal digits would appear. This is a representation of the chick bud, uh, limb bud, and you can see the three digits that are appearing and the normal limb. The ex several different types of experiments were done. They removed the zone of polarizing activity and the digits did not form. Another experiment that they did was add a second ZPA in the anterior region of the limb bud. And when that happened, there was mirror image duplication of the digits so that now you had extra digits forming and they were mirror image of one another. What's in ZPA? Well, it's been found that the zone of proliferate, the cells in the zone of prolifera, uh, zone of proliferating activity, produces retinoic acid. Retinoic acid initiates the production of sonic hedgehog, and it's sonic hedgehog that's produced here. That's important for regulating the AP axis, and what happens is a gradient of sonic hedgehog develops. It's more complex than that. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of this, uh, though not going into complete detail, what we have is again the fibroblast growth factor influences the cells of the zone of proliferating activity to actually produce the sonic hedgehog under the influence of retinoic acid. Here we see a retinoic acid gradient that's important for those cells to produce sonic hedgehog. The sonic hedgehog then influences GREM1, which inhibits bone morphogenetic protein. Initially, GREM1 is going to start this loop, and then it's going to have its important uh, influence in inhibiting bone morphogenetic protein and maintaining the levels of fibroblast growth factor so that the limb bud can develop. There's also differential expression of Hox genes, so the exact importance of this has not been um, worked out, but the Hox D and Hox A clusters appear to be very important in the development of the different bones of the limb. As we said, by the end of the fifth week of development, the limb has a paddle, and that paddle begins to be divided by ridges, and it is in these ridges that we begin to see uh, cell death occur, and the digits will emerge. These ridges are going to then divide the hand into the five digits. And the way this is done is via program cell death. Basically, the interdigital necrotic zones are going to develop 
and are going to allow for the formation of the digits. So we will have these zones here that are developing in between the developing digits. During this time, the apical ectodermal ridge will lose its influence over the mesoderm. FGFs become down-regulated, reg and bone morphogenetic proteins begin to play a role in apoptosis that occurs in these regions. It's also known that the retinoic acid is also going to influence cell death, though it's not known whether it's a direct influence or an influence through uh, bone morphogenetic proteins. In either case, what ends up happening is the digits are going to be formed, and the uh, long bone, all the bones are going to be in place, and they will exist as cartilaginous models. So by six weeks of development now, the cartilaginous models have developed and the cartilage is developing under the influence of SOX9. What you're going to find is the SOX9 is important for the differentiation of chondrocytes, whereas osteoblasts are regulated by CBFA and RUX2, so that mesenchymal cells that are present can differentiate into two different cell types depending on uh, which genes are expressed in those regions. In histology, you'll talk much more than about bone development. In terms of muscle development, we've already said that the limb bud develops the lower five cervical and upper two thoracic levels, as well as the lower four lumbar and upper two sacral levels. And so what this simply means is C5 through T1 uh, is where the upper limb develops, T1 or T2, and for the lower limb it is uh, L2, L3 down to S2. And you can remember we said that the skeletal muscle cells develop from somites. Those somites migrated into the limb bud and the nerves from the neural tube are actually going to follow so that the paraaxial mesoderm gives rise to the skeletal muscle cells. The skeletal muscle cells then are going to migrate into the limb bud and the nerves are going to follow them. Remind, just a reminder that the somite was divided into dermatome, myotome, and sclerotome and the myotome gives rise to the muscle cells. And this is from the muscle lecture and we can just go back to remember that there are muscle progenitors which are influenced by the expression of PAX3 and PAX7. And so this just shows you those progenitors. Then those muscle cells uh, undergo determination under the influence and expression of MIF5 and MyOD. And then they'll differentiate under the, with the expression of myogenin. And here you can now look at this and put the muscle development together with the limb bud development, seeing that initially there's this delamination process under the influence of PAX3. Migration can occur then. Uh, next, and these cells will migrate out again under the influence of several genes like LBX1. There's a proliferation phase uh, that's important, and after proliferation, determination, where the cells will be determined by MYF5 and MyOD, and then these cells will begin to fuse and differentiate under the influence of myogenin, either the MyoD, MRF4, or other genes that will then allow for the expression of muscle-specific uh, proteins. Uh, again, the sonic hedgehog is important in influencing the PAX1 uh, for the sclerotome development, but in addition, we have the influence of the Wnt 
genes in terms of the influence on MyOD and MyOD is going to be important in formation uh, in terms of forming those muscle cells. So the hypaxial muscles will develop into the limb bud muscles and will develop into two compartments a flexor and an extensor compartment. Again, initially the limb bug is segmental in that the limbs will develop from C5 through T1 in terms of muscles and then later the muscle cells combine and fuse. This just will remind us that we have a neural tube in the neural tube, we're going to give rise to the mantle layer. In there will be the anterior horn cells. The anterior horn cells will be then migrating outward from the mantle layer. And these anterior horn cells are going to follow the muscle cells out and innervate those muscle cells as they differentiate. In addition, we can point out that there's neural crest cells which will also send out their peripheral processes into the limb buds. And so that's how the nerves will get out into the limb buds as they follow from the basal plate outward to the ventral ramus and follow the muscles or from the dorsal root ganglion again through the ventral ramus spinal nerve back to the dorsal root ganglion and they will then synapse on cells in the ailer plate. If we look at what we know about some of the genes that influence limb development for example sonic hedgehog is important. Sonic hedgehog can give several different uh, varieties of congenital defects, one of which is the loss of son sonic hedgehog can lead to truncated limbs. Uh, if you have extra sonic hedgehog produced in aberrant sites, you can get mirror image duplication of the limbs. FGFs are important, and what we found is if a constellation of FGFs are not uh, present, then no limb. Uh, can occur. If you have FGF8, uh, FGF4, and FGF9 loss, but one copy of FGF9 remains, you get a truncated limb. In the mouse, if FGF10 is not present, there's no limb. So again, the importance of the fibroblast growth factor in limb development can be seen in some of these anomalies. Uh, in terms of WENT7, the WENT genes are important in terms of the fact that if you lose uh, WENT7, dorsal structures do not develop. Um, if WENT7 is on the dorsal and ventral ectoderm sides, then you'll get uh, dorsal structures on the polymer surface. That is, on the polymer surface, you may have a patient with fingernails. Uh, that is, fingernails on both the dorsal and ventral surfaces of the digits. This is one of the classic uh, examples of l limb uh, d d abnormalities. It's the effects of thalidomide. Thalidomide uh, was used in Canada, Germany, Japan. Uh, it was given initially to prevent morning sickness and uh, what happened was that uh, the Babies that survived all had limbs that didn't develop, focomelia. And uh, much time was spent trying to figure out what thalidomide did. It is a derivative of glutamic acid. And what it was found recently, just very recently, is that it inhibits both the production of tumor necrosis factor alpha and um, that's important in terms of the activity of interleukins and interferons. It also in a, inhibits polymorphonuclear chemotaxis, 
monocyte phagocytosis and uh, it inhibits proangiogenic factors that is factors that allow for the development of blood vessels so without the development of blood vessels the limbs could not survive in this case the loss of vascular endothelial growth factor and basic fibroblast growth factor inhibited angiogenesis and that was the effect of the thalidomide and why the limbs did not develop. Now there are significant uh, safeguards in place so that if a patient has to take thalidomide for other reasons uh, it is certainly uh, ensured that that patient cannot uh, get pregnant.